Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have Lillian Brummett here today, and she has a very special topic that she's going to talk about. She's going to talk about how to overcome grief and sadness. And Lillian, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Okay, well, hi, everyone. First, it's great to see you here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and Stacy for taking the time to do this with me. I really appreciate it. Um, it's great to speak with you. Uh, myself, Lillian Brummett is the name. I live in BC, Canada, in the Kootenai region of BC. It's right on the border of the states there. And um, with my husband of 33 years, we live in our dream location, uh, bought this property and turned it over into like it was a beat up sort of rental place. And we fixed it up and turned it into a little bit of a garden paradise here, which I'm loving. And uh, I'm 53, hubby's about 57-ish here in 2023. Um, we run a company called Brummett Media Group together, my husband and I. And uh, that involves two very popular blogs and a YouTube channel. It also includes our six published books, as well as the upcoming books this summer and next summer that we have planned in our roster. And uh, and Dave's drum teaching studio and drum repair business as well. So keeps us very busy. Mm -hmm. Now you've been through a lot in life and you mm -hmm. focus a lot on overcoming grief and sadness. Why don't you tell people a little about yourself and some of the obstacles you went through and how you overcame those obstacles? Because I think it's very important for people to understand, you know, we all go through obstacles in life. We all suffer from grief and trauma. Everybody has a story to tell. But the thing is, is that not everybody's able to overcome their obstacles and not everyone is able to cope with grief and the sadness can lead to depression, it can lead to anxiety and, um, you know, and it can lead to much more serious things than that. So it'd be great if you could share some of the traumatic things that you went through. You don't have to go into detail, but give some people an idea of some of the obstacles you went through and how you were able to actually overcome them. Okay. Um, okay. So, so, okay. So as going back to my childhood, um, my mom, my mom had some issues within herself. She had some holes within herself that she wasn't able to repair. And unfortunately that meant that she was, uh, attracting relationships that weren't healthy for her or for her children. Mm -hmm. She ended up marrying five times and she had boyfriends in between that and so us kids we were sometimes living with her sometimes not sometimes we had a new daddy sometimes there was boyfriends we were getting dragged around or put in the living room while she went in the back and visited with them and so we didn't have a very stable upbringing my brothers were actually on their own when they were 16 when my mom married her third time she brought us up from the states to Canada to marry this man. And um, I was on my own when I was 13. Now, the third husband, he was very, very abusive. Again, my brothers were on their own when they were 16 because of that. And, um, and so my mom sent me away yet again, uh, instead of leaving the husband and the situation. And so I was away a lot from her. And uh, during that particular time was really crucial for me because, you know, yet again, another incident happened with one of her men. And yet again, I'm the one that sent away, you know, so it was really harmful for me as mm -hmm. a kid. Um, so, yeah, I was sent away for almost two years. And then I came to live with her again when I was about 12 years old, maybe 11 something, probably around 12 so we're almost virtually strangers, right? She, yeah. you know, brings me into this women's shelter and we go into this transition home and then we're into our first apartment together with no furniture. We're sleeping on the floor. And at first it kind of wasn't an adventure. And, but unfortunately uh, she leaned on me like a friend, you know, as opposed to being a mother daughter relationship. Yep. And I ended up being like, like her partner in life, encouraging her and counseling her and being there in a position that no child should really be put in. Really. It put me mm -hmm. in a level of responsibility that I wasn't equipped for. 
anyway, there was a lot of anger and angst and issues within myself because I was now a broken person. And uh, I was kind of angry at her too, you know, for some of the choices that she was making and continued to make. And so we didn't really get along. It wasn't a very good situation, right? A broken mom mm. who was trying to recover and, you know, kids and all that. So it was just a lot of stress on her and broken kids. So uh, anyway, I um, I ended up being on my own before I was 13. And uh, when, when I was 13, sorry, I was about 13 and a half when I was first on my own. Basically came home to see a garbage bag and a half of my belongings sitting there with a note saying you're on your own. It was real cool. So um, I ended up surviving from that. I was already working because I was used to being self-sustainable. I was cleaning houses. I was working on in far at farms, you know, cleaning out chicken sheds. I did whatever I had to do. I worked in onion fields. I did all kinds of babysitting and various jobs just to keep things going, paying my rent. I actually rented my first apartment illegally, which I didn't know. And uh I got caught living on my own when I was 16 and they put me in foster care for about a year and a half or two or whatever it was. I think two years before you're legally able to live on your own again. Yeah. And that was a really awkward situation. But in that time, the foster mother was actually a social worker for children. And so she recognized what my symptoms that I was showing, you know, the nightmares, the chronic insomnia, the issues that I was having. And so she got me to talk about it. And then I ended up taking one of my stepdads to court um, for what he did. And she put, helped me through all of that and helped me understand myself. She got me in programs like the girls attendance program where mm -hmm. kids like us were um, learning how to be kids. Uh, learning, you know, that you don't have to be in survival mode and you don't always have to be afraid and you don't always have to do and accomplish. You can actually be a kid right now, you know? Right. And so that was really uh, very helpful for me. It really was very helpful for me. From that, um, I ended up putting myself through school, went back, got my high school. I got university level of high school because at the time I wanted to go into biology, into university. Um, I ended up switching gears, met my husband. Um, we, I started a business. I ran it for about six years. And then I got in this car accident. Now, right around this time, one of the friends that was in our circle, she was murdered. Um, by someone that uh, was like a dean or some sort of church official. I'm not really sure what they're all called or what type of church he was in, but some kind of deacon or whatever they are. And uh, he was a married man with two kids, but he saw her walking home from a party which, alone, which she shouldn't have done. And uh, we they found her about a month or six weeks later, something like that in a ditch. Like it was a real traumatic time for all of us. All our you know, male friends were being questioned that were at the party that night and all this stuff. It was like really, really traumatic. Then about uh, a year later, my neighbor behind me, kitty corner behind me, we didn't even know this was going on. Hardly talked to her, but she was this sweet old lady, widow or by herself. She got broken into. She got found a couple of days later, tied to the chair. And she had suffocated there. I mean, like it was just one thing after another. And then I got involved in another accident. This one took away my business. I lost my business. Um, it was a three car pileup. I was in the middle. Wasn't my fault. Doesn't matter. Still lost the business. That point, I hit chronic depression. <laughs> I was just like, that's it. You know, my mom was chronically ill. She was talking about, you know, death all the time. Uh, it was just a really hard time for me. And I found that I had to completely change my life and really protect myself. So I went into like overdrive and I just eliminated all the magazines, all the newspapers, canceled television, canceled anything, any relationship or anything that was negative in my life and just surrounded myself with positivity in a very selfish and bubble-like cocoon until I could heal myself. Um, writing became a really massive tool for me through all of this, healing through all of this, expressing myself in a very private way without having to worry about how it was sounding. It was really helpful for me. Um, 
we moved away. We were caregiving for my parents, but we moved away about three hour drive away. So we were driving back and forth, you know, uh, a couple of times a month. And that was kind of exhausting, but it was, you know, we had to do it to help make sure that they were okay. And the family farm was being run okay and stuff like that. And so uh, we were doing this back and forth and still trying to start our new life in this other area. Yeah. And then we got the phone call that my parents had uh, chosen their own way out together. And it was really like shocking. It was two days after Christmas and you get this call from the police station, you know, so off we went in the, in, you know, the wee hours of the morning and, uh, and started, you know, went through the process of dealing with their funeral, their estate planning and everything else that you deal with. It took a couple of years to deal with all of that kind of stuff, even though they had most of it ready for me. They were very, very uh, carefully planned their exit so that it wouldn't be as much stress on me, their, ex, uh, you know, dealing with their stuff, their, their estate, their wills and all of that. So, uh, right around that time we were also caregiving for Dave's dad he had moved right across the street from us so like during the week he was coming over for meals what have you I was sending him home with packages of food um when my parents passed we said that's it uh we're not gonna we're not gonna wait for tomorrow anymore our goals were like when we retire we're gonna move to our favorite beautiful place that we want to move to where we live now we were, when we retire, when we retire, when we get older, when the time is right, it was always tomorrow and striving for that. And um, at that point, we just stopped that thinking entirely. And we just realized that every breath, every moment right now is our golden moment. There's no guarantee that there's going to be another one. And there's no guarantee that even if we make it to those so-called golden years, that they're going to be golden, right? right? So we're living right now, right now for today. And so we doubled down on living our passion, which we were already on the journey of doing, um, creating positive change, getting really involved with uh, nonprofits, really changing our entire life to being more eco and positive and everything we were already on that journey but we doubled down on that we also sold our home which was our first home and we moved to this other location um dad followed us out here and so we care gave for him until about 2016 when he passed and then we dealt with his estate so that brings us up to date wow you've been you know through a lot and i think it's you know you know, seventy percent of our our um of society comes from dysfunctional families, and what happens is usually the behavior people repeat the behaviors of their dysfunctional mom or dad or the environment that they actually grew up in, and you know it seemed like throughout all the dysfunction that you experienced as a child, you still try to overcome it and you looked for therapy and that was great because you were able to get all those repressed emotions all those negative emotions built up inside outwardly and you were able to actually get guidance on how to cope with these emotions so that puts you on the right track you know and I think it's you know one thing I think is important is that you express to others you know how important it is to actually have some because we can't always solve things on our own sometimes it's good to actually have an unbiased opinion someone that could actually you know give you their opinion and also give you help and, and show you things that you might not even have thought of and you know what made you go for the therapy and what gave you the courage to open up to somebody that you didn't know because a lot of people are afraid to do that you know those are excellent questions um okay so initially in in when i was when I was on my own, before I went into the foster home and got help from the foster mother, I was in a position of, um, okay, uh, I was made to be the black sheep of the family. Even though I was looking after my mom and I was making the meals and I was working jobs and going to school mm -hmm. at that young age and still making like more than half of our meals and all of this, uh, I was still considered like the black sheep of the family. And so because I didn't, I didn't, um, 
I, I was outspoken. I would say when things were not right and I didn't comply. I didn't back down. And it got, uh, it got us in a situation where um, uh, I was considered the, the black sheep. Yeah. And so uh, that's, you know, and so even when I was on my own, I was, you know, paying my own rent. I wasn't doing drugs. I had runaways living with me. I was supporting them. Like I was trying to go to school, all the stuff was going on. And my family still was in the background, yak, yak, yak about how terrible I was. And I felt really angry about that. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to show you you know? And I was like, I was bound and determined to show them because of that. So it was almost like an anger, a justification, a, a seeking of retribution of, of righteous sort of, uh, you know, was going on inside myself at the time. I also had this incident where one of my stepdads who I took to court um, had spotted me outside of one of the schools and he was angry because I wasn't letting him know where my mother was living at the time and I don't know how he found out what school I was going to but he did and he stopped me outside the school and he was basically telling me after he got angry with me that I was never going to get over him that I was always going to be haunted by him he was always going to be a part of my life what we had together and all of this so um that made me really angry and that anger was a drive for me so I was like you're not going to be a part of my life and I am not going to be permanently damaged by this and you are not going to continue to have control over me and I went and I uh, out of that kind of determined sort of uh sense anger sense I came from it so it may not have started from a positive way of heading on that journey yeah but I was driven to go on that journey because of that I was because of my mom being such a voracious reader and a believer in literacy. And uh, she always took us to the library and we'd come home with, you know, arms loaded up with books and stuff like that. So I was very, you know, uh, I had a connection to books. And so I would go to the library and I would take every self-help book that they had and mm -hmm. I would just take it home and digest it and digest it and take notes. And I had like literally binders of notes that I had been like studying self, you know, right. learning self. And I started that journey in my early twenties, uh, much more in depth because I had gone through the foster home and her help and her counseling, uh, opening up to her was really terrifying because, you know, no one had talked about it. It was like, you know, nobody talks about this. Mm -hmm. It's a secret, you know, nobody talks about this. And so out it came and then it opened up the door for the second time in my life where it changed everything. Now it's courts, now it's lawyers, now it's this, it was all that stress. So I, she, when she put me in those various classes to learn how to be a kid and not just be in survival mode, it started me off on this journey of like, okay, well, who am I? What do I like to do? What are my favorite colors? What, you know, where do I want to go in my life? And so it sent me off in that direction. Each one of these were like these massive steps that led me to these to the direction of healing you know even today I find sometimes I go through some some healing you know mm -hmm. uh it's been well 2009 was when my parents passed and still sometimes that rolls around where it'll come up again um yeah. you'll see something on tv or you'll hear something or you'll get into a conversation and you realize oh I've got some more healing to do there, you know, yeah. but it's a journey. It's a long time journey. I think we just have to be really patient with us, ourselves and be willing to find what works for us. For me, um, opening up and talking to someone in person wasn't uh, where I was able to go comfortably, but I found turning to the pen, turning to the keyboard, turning to books, uh, delving into that was really, really helpful for me. Now, you know, you had... A, a numerous amount of obstacles come your way. And it seemed like every time you moved three steps forward, you got knocked back two steps. So, you know, for most people, you know, as a human being, we can only take so much. And then, mm -hmm. you know, just like a boiling water and, you know, like when you have a flame underneath the water, eventually, if you don't lower that flame, the water is going to boil over. How were you able to cope and move forward without giving up? 
what ignited you? Because, you know, you know, for me personally, you know, I, I've been through a lot of traumatic events and sometimes it could be overwhelming because we're human, you know, mm. what made you keep moving forward or try to move forward? Cause you got knocked back a lot of times and you got, you knocked, you got knocked down to the ground many times. What made you get up and keep moving forward? I actually don't really know I think just a desperation that something's got to be better mm -hmm. and, you know and the knowledge that no one was going to do it for me that I had to do it for myself like it's a it's a terrifying thought yeah. because I think we're we always hope that there's going to be the someone else that's going to be the knight in shining armor or the nitrous or whatever in shining armor yeah. but uh for for it, there is no such thing you know where there is only us that is going right. to do it you know and I felt um that I was in this relationship when I was uh oh I don't know 16 to maybe 19 and it was on again and off again and I thought you know it was my true love and my deep deep you know first everything right so it was uh but really it wasn't I think a normal type of first love. Right. It was more like clinging on to someone that loved me. Right. And when that relationship ended, even though it wasn't a healthy relationship and neither of us were doing well with it, you know, we still ended up going back and going back. And um, uh, I realized then that if I was going to have um, like happiness, if I was going to find uh, someone to spend my life with I had to work on myself I right. had to find out who I was and understand who I was and start working on self um how could someone how could I trust in the love of someone else when I wasn't showing them the real me I was showing them pictures and faces that I had learned to put on masks that I had you know responses that you learn these are approved these are okay okay this is what I'm doing and not really being me authentically me because I didn't know me who is me you know right so I think I had to go on that journey I was on that journey only about a year and a half after that relationship ended when Dave found me and he started trying to convince me that you know we should be together yeah. and at the time I thought I'm not sure I'm ready because do I really know myself? I'm still on this journey. But then I realized through talking with many other people, even those who grew up in those white picket fence scenarios, um, they are also going through that. We are all going through that on a continual yeah. basis. Who are we now? You know, how are we evolving? How are we feeling about things? Are we just responding because this is our learned path or are we being authentically ourselves? And um, I think we are all on this journey and it's a constant thing. At the time though, it was um, very new territory for me. And so yeah. I was um, sort of, started on that journey my husband was a phenomenal support he got me talking he got me to be able to express something so that I clam up or I just leave you know something's difficult I'll leave that's it right. I'm out I'm gone or um you know uh or I just clam up and then nothing's nothing's wrong you know just everything's fine and uh, he would get me to speak about things how I was feeling about things and that um so uh yeah I've had so many wonderful people that have had such amazing impact on me there was one woman a neighbor of mine who was going through her own journey and a uh, single mother of like four or five kids and she and I were were having coffee as we usually did at a certain time of the day in between my shifts or something like that and um she was saying uh a scenario that helped her learn how to heal some of the wounds that she had and she said I had to learn how to take the fish hook out that they put into me, right? Take that out and then allow that wound to heal. Yes. And then that is going to scar and that scar will always be there. And I'll always see that scar, but it doesn't define me and it doesn't have to continue to be this open festering wound, right? We exactly. can allow it to heal. And when she said that to me, for some reason, it just clicked and it, it was just steps like that, you know, that just yeah. give you these, I guess, brief epiphanies in your life that say, oh yeah, that's exactly, you know, and it, so many people along the way, just brief conversations that they didn't even know that it affected me in such a powerful way, but it did. It helped me along that journey. 
Now, how did you find your true purpose in life? How did you find that passion? First of all, the passion at, you know, you went on a, on a, on a, on a journey where you finally took all of this tragedy and you turned it into something positive. You moved forward in life. How did you find your purpose in life? How did you get the passion to move forward in life? Well, um, part of it stems back to, uh, somewhere in my 24 ish time period, just before I started, um, it was about the time when I was starting my business. I think I was going to the college looking at, um, these like personality tests that they do for right. students that sort of, you know, what do you like, where are your talents, you know, what kind of careers meld around those, you know, and that's where I was learning that biology was something that I was wanting to head towards it was right around that time period when I started, you know, really understanding a little bit more about myself and um, what things I liked, because I never really asked those questions of myself, right, never even crossed my mind, right, I was always just surviving. So it was uh, there that I started. And, you know, honestly, writing came up in those, uh, those tests, multiple times, various writing professions. And I just kept on no, nay saying that can't be that can't be, you know, me a writer, you know, who's gonna yeah. listen to me, you know, little me. And so I didn't really think I had that kind of, um, power that kind of uh that I could have an impact that way so I was looking at different things um but when the accident happened I went back to that um I still kept all those papers and I was going through that and trying to decide okay where where are my passions where do I want to go and I knew I loved nature I love being in nature I love gardening it's a therapy for me writing I love writing what can I do with this where can I go with these things and so I started exploring that I became involved with the seeds of diversity organization I started saving seeds from extinction through working with their grow up programs and things like that and that gave me a purpose it also helped me bond more with my mom who was a master gardener so on that we started building a new relationship um, very carefully mm -hmm. um, then when uh, the accident happened, I realized, okay, now I, I have these physical limitations. Where am I going to take this? So I started looking at writing a little more seriously. By this time, I had had some short stories and some poetry that had won contests and then published in various magazines or something, you know, that I got paid for here and there or whatever, and or an anthology that I got published in, things like that little things. And um, at that point, I thought, well, I got a little bit of a resume here, you know, maybe there's something to this. And so yeah. I started taking this writing course that taught me the business side of writing. Now, writing is what led me to discover my passions, and to full further develop my passions. Because when I started working as both a freelance writer, a staff writer, and a staff and an assignment writer, during a three or four year period there, I was constantly being approached to cover topics like alternative agriculture, alternative uh, energy, uh, green living, uh, sustainable mm -hmm. topics, gardening, mm -hmm. seed saving, um, you know, uh, highlighting nonprofit organizations. All this stuff was coming up, as well as some like I would get assigned to go attend at like a city meeting and report on that. But right. the ones that I was really enjoying we're leaning in that direction. And so that led me, that was my, you know, biggest stepping stone in my career where it is now. Um, that was the biggest stepping stone was, was, you know, just tapping my fingers in, seeing what gave me the biggest thrill. Where did I feel like I was having the most positive impact with the energy that I was putting out my return on investment in right. regards to the positive impact that I was having. We, we would get letters from people that would just, Oh, I didn't know that what I was doing with the recycle, you know, participating in the recycling system. I didn't know that they had such a measurable impact in this regard, or we encouraged, wow. you know, people wow. to get involved with uh, volunteering or uh, exploring alternatives, like alternative uh, agriculture, uh, topics and stuff and to have the response from the readers 
who were just really intrigued and encouraged and motivated by the topics we were having. We were like, yeah, this is where we need to go. And it just sort of took us from that. You know, here we are some 25 years later, you know, it's grown to something pretty big for us now, but you know, that's where it started. That's awesome. So you've written quite a few books now, right? Yes. How many books have you written? Uh, well, altogether, we have uh, published seven books. There are currently one is no longer in, in production. There are now six books on Amazon that people can look up. Just type in Brummet, B-R-U-M-M-E-T, to find them there. And we have a trilogy coming out this summer. And we have another book coming out this uh the next summer. So uh, a lot on our plate right now. Really excited. We're in that uh, final throes of the final tweaks, you know, before production yeah. that authors go through, which I know you're very familiar with all the books that you have as well. So <laughs> <laughs> we're in that stage where it's like that nail biting stage is everything in place. Yes, but it'll be it's going to come up this summer. This trilogy is actually a collection of Dave's late father's writings. Mm-hmm. So it involved uh <laughs> transcribing loose leaf paper um, from boxes or little pamphlet sort of booklets that he put together of his writings and all this. Uh, And then going through all the rewrites and notes that he had made. So I'd have written, I've transcribed at all types and then I'd find a new version of it and I'd have to go back and find it and put, you know, make the new version. So it took about three months Mm -hmm. of transcribing boxes and filed folders and all this stuff and uh to get the three the three books out of it so yeah if we're really excited to celebrate his life he was a phenomenal poet um really really good uh, short stories funny stuff that he you know and family memoirs like the family memoir uh section um of that trilogy is phenomenal um stacy like uh the power of memoirs is just incredible i learned so much about what women went through yeah, through the story of Dave's grandmother, who was born in Romania in a small, small village, right? And back then, the it, it was normal for the poor people to send their children off into servitude, right? So she mm-hmm. was twelve years or eleven years old or something. She sent off to servitude, and then when she was like I don't know, sixteen or seventeen, I don't know, maybe nineteen, right around there, she gets this opportunity to come to Canada by a train, by a boat, by a train again, to go meet a man she's never met before and take on his four or five kids from his previous marriages. He's a, he's a widow twice over, oh, and wow. then, and that was Dave's dad's mother his grandmother so she you know and her story about what she went through and and the depression and all of this that you know the stories are just phenomenal and it really takes into perspective how golden our roads are like we look at our world and we think all oh, these are all these things but really we live such a golden path because it was yeah. laid by all of these people behind us all of these ancestors who worked so hard to make the world better a better place what we live here today and hopefully we do the same for future generations but phenomenal stories in those memoirs absolutely wow and you said we you could find all these books on amazon correct you can find them on amazon yeah and the trilogy's coming out this summer so woo-hoo. oh that's all <laughs> i'm so congratulations yeah. I'm thank so you excited for you now thank if you. people wanted to find you do you have a website that you could tell people about Absolutely. Yeah. Bremetmedia.ca is our main website, B-R-U-M-M-E-T media.ca. They can also just do an internet search, just type in the word Bremet or Lillian Bremet, Lillian and Dave Bremet, and you're going to find pages and pages of links to find us on various social networking sites and lots of interviews like this. You'll be able to find us there too. Of course, I encourage everyone to drop into Amazon and check out our books there too, if they get the chance. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, Lillian, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all this information. And before we go, do you have any tips for anybody that you want to share? If people are going through trauma, if they're going through tragedy and 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 they're feeling very down and very sad, 
Is there, is there any type of tips that you can give them to kind of help them so they can stay on the right track and they can have the courage to, to move forward and, and to really progress and, and do what you just did is you went through a tragedy, you turned it into something positive and you didn't let it get you down. You move forward in life and now you've accomplished great things. Do you have any tips for people that, you know, want that for themselves, but they just don't feel that they're capable of getting it? Yes. Um, the first thing that you need to do is break the, the routine that you're in. So we tend to get into this routine, this rut. We put our blinders on. It's uncomfortable to get out of that uh, situation. And we just want to curl up with our blanket and our pajamas. And we don't want to move forward out of that nice little cocoon that we've built for ourselves, even though it's a depressive cocoon that we've built for ourselves. The only way that we can do that is to to get out of that rut, get out of that routine. So get up early in the morning, get dressed, you know, in a nice, in a nice way. You don't have to get into your church clothes or whatever, but mm -hmm. get into something nice. Uh, start treating yourself well, start taking your vitamins, drink your water. Then I would really suggest that you take some time out of your schedule where you can just be in nature and just zen, even if it's a park, if it's on your deck, looking at a potted flower, wherever you can be around nature or running water is really, really uh, therapeutic. Try not to be around your devices too much. Avoid negative content in your life, television shows, things you're mm -hmm. watching on your devices, books that you're reading, newspapers, magazines. If you're being exposed to negativity, such as like the news hour, maybe it's time to cut those things out of your life because right. right now you're trying to change your life. You're trying to feed your brain with positivity. Get involved in some kind of volunteer activity where you feel like you're making a difference. Maybe um, reading in a hospice situation, reading for them is maybe not the best thing to do because it's a little bit depressing. Maybe you need to get into something like um, you're going to get involved in a in a re uh, where they're uh, rehabilitating um, right. a stream or something like that, and yeah. you can get involved in planting helping them plant that stream, something where you feel like you're really making a difference, where you can really see the measurable impact will really help you um, and get it out. Um, the best thing to do is get out your piece of paper, pen, keyboard, whatever, type out how you're feeling and don't show anybody. This isn't for anybody else. It's not so you can be criticized. You're not going to be judged by anybody. You can pour all the hateful, awful, garbage just puke it all out on the on these paper and then what you do is you print it out if you have already done it on a computer and normally I can serve paper but in this situation you want to print it out and you want to take it outside somewhere safe where you can do this or in a can somewhere and you want to light it on fire mm. and you want to burn it now this is something that a lot of ancient shaman uh, type, it's a therapy. Yes. It's a, it's a, um, it's a way of releasing your thoughts and saying, okay, I felt this way. I've purged it. It's gone. It's out. I'm releasing it. And I can fill that space that I've just cleared out now with positivity. It's like a weight starts getting off of your shoulders, that elephant yes. weight that sits on your chest or your back. And you feel it all the time when you're feeling that grief and you're in that depression. It really is like an elephant sitting on your chest and you have to like get those moments of breath. And so mm -hmm. you can start bringing in moments here and there of these positive releases. That's where I would start. That's great. I love those tips. Those are really good Thank tips. You. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you yeah. so much. I, I really appreciate your time on the show. You've given us a world of information and thank you so much for sharing your story. I know it's not easy to talk about and I appreciate you sharing it with the world. This way other people can learn from you and they can relate to you and they can this, you know, I definitely think a podcast like this could change people's lives. So thank you so much for coming on the show and thank sharing you. everything that you've shared today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I really appreciate it. It's, it's great to be here and you're a wonderful host. So thank you oh. for having me. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for being on the show and you have a great day. You too.